The American Virgin Islands of St. John is two-thirds national park and it's surrounded by natural beauty. After visiting it once, I had to go back. This time around, I spent a lot of time hiking. And while I was absorbing it all, I learned a lot about the sugarcane industry and its unfortunate connection to African slave trafficking. I also went on a search for authentic native cuisine and on my search, not only did I become aware of some of the most nutritionally potent ingredients on the planet, I've now incorporated them into my daily diet and it's taken my energy levels and mental clarity to a peak I didn't even experience in my 20s. I also became enlightened. I never realized the impact that thousands of years of slavery has had on what and how we eat today. With the increased population of tourism and second home ownership in the Caribbean, it's become hard to find purely authentic native cuisine in most of the Caribbean. But if you search hard enough, the footprints are always there. This long-standing favorite serves pate, sort of. It's more like an empanada with a pate style filling. Hercules Pate Delight has been serving pate for over 38 years, taking only one unfortunate break in 2010 when the little shack experienced a catastrophic fire. I also met the Roadie King. His food truck serves authentic roti. Roti is one of the most popular and widely known cuisines in the Caribbean. What would you recommend if I've never had a roti in my life? Uh, so maybe I need to tell you what a roti is. Tell me. Uh, it's originally an Indian dish. And uh, so the roti is the, the bread, it's like a naan bread or like a flour tattoo. Uh, so we make out some scratch. It's similar to a cross between a pita and a tortilla. Yeah. Is the roti made with wheat flour? A regular, regular white flour. White flour? Mm -hmm. Oh, white, I bet that's what I meant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I make my dough myself, I do everything myself. I've been in the business. I've been working for over 45 years now. 45? Yes, sir. You don't even look 45. <laughs> I've been in the restaurant business too. Oh uh, yeah? 47. Okay. Well, you, you're looking well, buddy. I mean, for your age. Abdu arrived on St. John in 2012 and hails from Nevis. He spent 20 years perfecting his dough recipe. He makes all of the dough using the food truck in his home in the evenings and in the early mornings. And at 64 years young, he's a culinary force to be reckoned with. I'm glad that you put the oil from the spray bottle rather than use the yeah. aerosol. I ordered a mix of the goat and the chicken curry roti. That's it. Beautiful. Thank you very much. That's awesome. Thank you, man. That's awesome. It's hard to pick up. The dish is a West Indies staple with Indian roots, resembling a burrito. It's more like a stew in a soft dough shell with potatoes instead of rice. That's so good. But who I met next impacted me deeply. After cooking professionally and cooking around great chefs for over 40 years, finding something truly new is like being introduced to your favorite toy as a kid for the first time. And that is what Shaibu did for me. This is Shaibu. Um, my name is Shaibu Abdullahi, originally from Ghana. I happen to have been lucky, one of the lucky few that got selected from a DVI lottery program by the United States government. I came, I was lucky and enrolled myself in culinary school, the Culinary Institute of America. After graduating right around 2008, 2009, when the economy uh, was sour, uh, very, very bad, I basically had issues uh, securing a job. Shaibu had some humble beginnings starting his career as a chef. He introduced St. John to Ghana style plantain chips as a street vendor. I got hired by Canil Bay in 2010. Now, when I came, there was a lot of similarities with the culture that I grew up in, in Ghana. One of the cuisines that the locals have here is what they call the mofongo. And that mofongo goes across the entire Caribbean. They might have a different name that they call it. However, um, it's the same application. And we know the history with regards to Africa, the slave trade, and the Caribbean. I asked him if he would help me find authentic Caribbean recipes, and he paused. Um, that's one thing that I have not been able to perhaps, you know, discover or find. Like St. Kitts and Barbados, St. John's history of sugarcane production created slave trade, and with it came African culture. It's somewhat hard to distinguish between which dishes are authentically Caribbean 
and which are variations of dishes found in Africa. How the slaves came over and they decided to use the local ingredients to try to make it to have the same texture or the same flavors back home fascinates me a lot as a chef. It was easy for me to kind of, you know, fall in and be like, oh, I can cook this. This is how we cook it back home, but blend it with the Caribbean style. So the mofongo back home, we call it fufu. Anywhere on the sub-Saharan country, we have our fufu. Either we make it with yam, cocoa yam, plantain, tapioca or cassava. Here in the Caribbean, when the slaves came over, they would basically make it with plantain. So we have our plantain that are already peeled and then we will fry it. So now, uh, the perfect temperature. They will fry, but not fry to try to get a crust, but just to cook the plantain. So while that's cooking, can we soak that sea moss? I'm super curious about it. Shaibu introduced me to sea moss. I've never heard of it before. Sea moss gel is a natural nutrient rich product derived from sea moss. Some people mix it with water to make a puree that they take by the spoonful or add to a smoothie. The gel has a texture similar to aloe vera, not as gelatinous, and it tastes, well, like nothing. <laughs> it does have a subtle essence of like sea flavor, but like all seaweeds, sea moss is high in minerals such as iodine, potassium, calcium, as well as many vitamins and proteins. You see how dry it is? Yep. Then that one has, is rehydrated. You can see that the difference, it's voluminous. How long does it take to rehydrate? As long as you soak it, it will rehydrate. It will absorb the water. Before you make it into a gelatin, how, how, much, how, much, how long do you usually soak it for? As soon as the temperature changes, oh, the water, because it's cold, it, it's it just, it just ah. melts. So you're water. not really going by absorption, you're going by heat. I'm going, yep, it'll fall oh, apart, right. Here we have some of the finished product that after rinsing and everything, I have put in some of my spices cinnamon, nutmeg, cardamom, juniper berries, however you want it. What is the flavor of it with nothing in it? What does it taste like? It tastes like water, sea salt? It, it, we will get to taste it, but the flavor is just kind of flat. Flat, interesting. I put in nutmeg and cinnamon in this. Why? Because across the Caribbean, especially down South Island, Grenada, St. Kitts, when they say spice, they don't mean cayenne spice. They mean nutmeg, cinnamon, anise. As a matter of fact, I can give you a little tasting of it. You will get the notes of the cinnamon and nutmeg, but then get the texture of how it works in It's your unique. Own. It's creamy in a very different way than I would, was expecting. And I always anticipated in my mind that I would be tasting uh, a little bit of something ocean flavored, but not at all. It's like still very smooth. It's coated in my mouth, but not like in a starchy way and not quite like in a gelatinous way like jello. It's, it's interesting. In that. Are those salted or unsalted? These are unsalted. The ratio is one to one? One to one, pretty much, as you can tell. Um, almond milk? Almond milk. Unsweetened, unflavored? Unsweetened, unflavored. And then depending on what anybody like, if they like to sweeten it with natural sweetener, banana, agave. So in, in our case, we'll sweeten it with half banana and then maybe a little bit of uh, agave. And you can see how it pours out. With all the banana and the different ingredients in there, you taste that more than the moss. Yeah, 100%. The, you barely taste the moss, but the texture is very, it's very prevalent. And I would imagine that if you added more ice to this and you puree it a little further, you could probably make like a sorbet with it. Correct. Oh, Correct. You can use it in, to make sorbet, um, ice cream. Uh, basically, its application is it's enormous. Look at this guy. He's in great shape. He eats sea moss every day. Another incredible potent and delicious ingredient Shaibu turned me on to was hibiscus flour. Packed with antioxidants, it can help to lower your blood pressure. Studies have shown that it lowers fat levels in blood. 
It boosts liver health and it contains compounds known to help prevent cancer. It decreases the growth of bacteria and it may help in weight loss. I put a link to all the studies that talk about these things and the benefits of hibiscus in the description below, along with the link where you can get some. You steep it just like you steep it your tea. In mine, I add some star anise. I add some juniper berries and clove, which here we will call spice and a stick of cinnamon. And then I brew it and then we get this nice flavorful tea and the health benefits are enormous. Yeah, here, try it. Wow, it smells amazing. Oh my God. Talk about antioxidants. There's no it's loaded you, with Is there it. any sugar in this? There's a little agave. Wow. How long does this take before it gets soft approximately? Uh, even if you're making it for the first time, make sure you're, if you have the thermometer to, and how many people are going to cook at home that will have the thermometer to my, check all, all of my viewers, the, okay. I push thermometer okay. cooking. <laughs> okay. So as long as you have that 300, um, 275, 300 degree um, oil, then stick it in there for about maybe three to five minutes. Oh, okay. As long as you don't get crust on it. Right. On the plantain. And it's cooked through. So this is exactly how I want it. I know that they are now cooked through. I can start to take them out of the oil without getting discoloration on the crust or anything. So we're going to allow it to cool down for us to be able to handle before we either smash or pound. One other thing the slaves uh, brought over with them in terms of their food was soup. So across the Caribbean, it's a different rendition, but they all call it kalalu. The kalalu leaf, which is a leafy green, it's also different from every island. So Jamaica, they might call their kalalu leaf different and they might call it even spinach. Uh, here they call it spinach, but the, the leaf, the, the edible leaf is different. We're going to try to replicate what the slaves brought over to the Caribbean in terms of uh, kalalu leaf. So today we're going to be using spinach, okra, carrots, garlic, onion, celery. And what's this here? And that is conch. Conch. Oh, so and truly a Caribbean and some plantain. Mm -hmm. Truly, the conch is, is truly a Caribbean classic. And so mm -hmm. you can make the soup, soup started out as a vegetarian based soup. And if you wanted to, you can add, you can even add meat to it, right? Is that right. common? So really, right. it's a universal Anyhow, soup. It's a pot dish. Back in the day, slaves would quickly put together something, eat and go back to the field to work they would put all their food together in a pot. There is no finesse, but I want to be a little bit rustic and do it just like, you know, they might do it maybe back in the day. Instead of using peeler, they might even just wash this and not peel it, cut it and just put it in, you know, as quick. Put all of this together. The universal trinity. Everybody who makes any stock, any broth, carrots, celery, onions, especially down in uh, southern portion of the United States. And then we'll put in a little bit of olive oil. And then we'll put a uh, plantain. Some people put cocoa yam, some put yams. Is there any preparation in advance to the con? Either pressure cook it or boil it to get it nice and soft. So tender. How long does it take for the plantain to soften? No, no, it doesn't take long. Just like you're cooking any potato, I will now put in my salt and pepper. You use some of this fabulous island salt, salt. from the salt pond? Yep. How long do you let that simmer for? Actually, that should come to a boil. So all the vegetables are nice and tender. Then I add my okra, my mm -hmm. spinach greens, which I already cooked and blanched. What and seasoning did you put in that? Uh, that secret? Uh, no, it's not secret. It's uh, I put in dried oregano, dill, coriander, dried garlic, dried onions. So basically equal parts? Equal, equal parts. So in here, it looks like you put in a total of maybe a, two teaspoons of spice. Correct. Roughly. Correct. The color is quiet here, quite different 
from it being raw. Gets more yellow. Yeah. Some parts of the island, they have the coconut milk. So we put a dose, which is like about half a cup in there. And then we will add our Kalalu leaf. That looks beautiful. Look how beautiful that is. Right. So colorful. As long as all the vegetables are nice and soft, it's cooked. So what's creating the thickness? Plantain? Nope. It's literally light. Yeah, it is really light. You don't put that much liquid in it, so it becomes almost like a cross between a soup and a stew. Correct. But the thickening agent maybe here could be okra. the okra. Yeah. So do you, George, do you like heat? I do. I okay, love heat. so I can put some Go ahead, yeah. crushed pepper in there. So good though. Thanks. It's got such a nice flavor base. Yeah. Oh, I see. Now you're going to smash some plantains to do fried plantains. Cool. Yeah. So I use my knife. I go like that. So this here is the patacones. In some other places, they will call it tostones. Mango? Avocado. Wow. Holy cow. That's huge. These are local? Yeah. This is mango salsa. I can give you a sliver of the avocado to try. Nice and creamy. And, and looking at the skin, it almost looked like it was, it was ripening up. It's butter. Mm hmm So this is a, for a quick party. Super Bowl at home. Healthy Super no, Bowl. Healthy Super Bowl. So now that the plantains are cool, we're going to make the mafungo. Yeah. Now, typically, you were telling me that in Africa, they would do you this. see how in, easy it's. Yeah, much easier. And in Africa, you would smash this in. We will pound it in mortar and pistol, wooden. After I crush it like this, I can put it through a food processor. But in Africa, there's no food processor, I would imagine. No. Will, you just keep so we just mashing pound it. it. Yep. yep. You basically, if I'm correct me if I'm wrong, you're making like a mashed potato. Like a mash. You make it into, you know, like a ball. You can see it's starchy. It becomes like malleable. You can use your hand to take it, you know, dip it in your soup to eat oh, it. Oh, just like that? Yeah. It's done? Yeah. Wow. No salt? We, did we add salt to it? We didn't, we didn't add, add salt. Do you? No salt. Wow. Back home, we don't add salt. And I'll take it and I'll basically put it with the soup like that. And eat it with my hand. So you take it like this and you stick it in the juices of the soup? Juices and scoop. You scoop everything and... Like a dumpling almost. Yeah. Just like that. Man, that's so good. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Shaibu also made for me conch fritters. We started cooking together at 10 a.m. And if he didn't have to prepare for an event he was catering, we probably would have cooked until 10 p.m. I have an expression that I use a lot how uh, God takes manure and from that he makes flowers. Correct. And even though man had a terrible intentions with the slave trade, the flowers is the fact that you and I never met before this. Mm -hmm. We're now friends for life, we're chefs for life. Yeah. And, uh, and you invited me into your kitchen, yeah. gave me half of your time, half of your day, and you introduced me to spectacular cuisine. My wheel's already turning. You, my home is your home. You awesome. come visit me in New York awesome. and I cannot thank you enough for sharing your time in your kitchen with me. You're most welcome. No, well, it's okay. Dirty no hands. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> thank you. What I love about Chaibu is that he truly taught me how the local ingredients in all of the Caribbean were used to replace the traditional ingredients that the slaves used back home on the continent of Africa. Surprisingly, I'm all too familiar with slavery on a personal level. I lived in Greece for two years and I received a crash course on how Greeks were slaves to the Turks for over 400 years. 400 years not only impacts your life, but it metamorphosizes your culture. I mean, there's no question that the occupation of Turkey and Greece impacted Greek cuisine and vice versa. You go to a Greek or an Armenian or a Turkish restaurant today and you see many of the same classic staples on the menus. Baklava, tzatziki dolmadas or dolmas or they're actually stuffed grapevine leaves they're just some examples and each culture makes their own rendition differently netflix released a series called high on the hog it's about how african-american cuisine has impacted cuisine in the united states and after shaibu taught me how the african slave trade contributed to the cuisine in the caribbean and after learning through the documentary high on the hog how the presence of african-american slaves revolutionized southern cooking in the united states and after reflecting on my own roots as a descendant of enslaved greeks 
I came to the revelation that whether or not cooking evolves through positive or negative circumstances, it really is the great neutralizer and unifier that connects the world in a way that transcends both the flaws and the merits of humanity. I put together a playlist showcasing some amazing recipes and some super healthy ingredients that you should consider incorporating into your diet. And I'll be releasing shortly my hibiscus super tonic. Definitely changed my life. Cheers. Mm -hmm.